So here you are, young men and women in the prime of your life, sitting in front of a computer or maybe a handheld device, listening to a lecture on anthropology. What's with that? Today I want to address both aspects of that question. First, why anthropology? And second, what does it mean to be in college, taking classes and listening to lectures? We'll start with the first one. Why study anthropology at all? Let me suggest four reasons. First, anthropology as a science expands our knowledge of the world and the peoples in it. It's an ideal major or co-major or minor for people who are living and working in a globalizing world. Second, with its focus on relativism, anthropology pushes us to see the world through the eyes of others. Instead of condemning others as backward or crazy or evil or ignorant, anthropology teaches us to find the context that make their collective actions understandable. Because of this, anthropology can help you develop the tools for managing and appreciating differences in a world of increasing cultural complexity. Let me make a quick shout out to Anthropology 301 Intercultural Relations, a course here at Miami that takes this uh, development of tools for managing difference uh, as its primary subject. But anthropology can also be a tool of self-discovery. The philosopher Paul Ricoeur once described anthropology as understanding the self through the detour of the other. Or, as the great social theorist Pierre Bourdieu has written, as we learn the processes by which people are culturally produced, we come to understand how we are culturally produced, which can liberate us from social habits and enable us to have greater capacity to act effectively in the world. Anthropologists learn what they know about culture from detailed ethnographic study of everyday lives among the communities that they study. They analyze this data to understand the meanings uh, that activities and events have for the communities in which they occur and the social functions that their practices serve. How significant is anthropological knowledge? How reliable is it? How useful is it? I'm going to let you decide. I'm going to offer you today a brief anthropological study of college life and let you decide how accurately it portrays the system of meanings and social institutions and everyday practices in which you find yourselves living. My account is built on three ethnographies, each conducted at a major university in the United States. Michael Moffat's Coming of Age in New Jersey, conducted at Rutgers. Rebecca Nathan's My Freshman Year, conducted at Northwestern University. And Susan Bloom's My Word, uh, conducted at Notre Dame University. Now, there isn't just one university culture, there are at least three. There's a student culture, a faculty culture, and an administrative culture, and each of these has its own worldview and its own sets of practices that are consonant with that view. Um, by worldview, uh, what anthropologists mean is an encompassing picture of reality that's based on shared assumptions about how the world works. How we see the world affects how we act in it. In this lecture, we'll concentrate on student culture. One of the first things anthropologists learn from college students is that college life is seen as a transitional stage uh, between home life, uh, in which they grew up, and the real world that they expect to enter. Home life is associated with childhood, and it's organized by parental authority. College life is associated with freedom from parental authority. But that freedom introduces new tensions over how to use that freedom. Students want to explore all the things they are now free to do, but also to do what's necessary to prepare for the work, um, the, the work uh, that's going to follow college life. College students talk about the stage after college as real life. Real life means life as an adult, with all the freedom and all the responsibilities that that entails. The most important of these is work finding meaningful and well-paying jobs in the labor market. Now, to an anthropologist, this looks a lot like a rite of passage, a ritual process through which a person is transformed from one kind of person into another. Rites of passage have three phases, separation, transition, and re-aggregation. In the first stage, separation, members of the community remove themselves from their previous everyday mode of existence, as when students leave home and enter dorm life. The third stage, reaggregation, involves a return to the everyday social world, but with a new social status, such as adult or college graduate and commissioned officer. And the acquisition of these new statuses is often marked by ceremony, as in a graduation ceremony with robes and caps and speeches and uh, applauding parents and so forth. 
College, then, is the in-between stage, the transition stage between childhood and adult life. This in-between stage is especially interesting because it's marked by two experiences anthropologists call liminality and communitas. In the transition period, people are in between two social categories, in this case, child and adult. People in transition are said to be in a state of liminality. Liminality is the experience of being betwixt and between two social statuses. Identities are ambiguous in the liminal state, and they're capable of being transformed or reinvented. Because of this, liminality is often a time of exploration and discovery. Finally, liminality is often marked by anti-structure, a condition in which the normal social structure ceases to apply. College students, for example, find the rules and regulations of public school and the household have been replaced by less restrictive but also less supportive rules in college. The second feature of the transition stage is called communitas. People in a liminal state to, uh, come together and often form intense comradeship with one another, in which social distinctions become unimportant. Communitas invites the creation of unstructured or minimally structured communities of equal individuals. So, what is life in transition like? College, as students in these studies saw it, is about learning, but it's also about coming of age. College was understood to be a place where you went to break away from home, to learn responsibility and maturity, and to do some growing up. College is about being on your own, about autonomy, about freedom from the authority of adults, however benign their intentions. And last but hardly least, college is about fun, about unique forms of peer group fun, before, in student conceptions, the gray actualities of adult life in the real world begin to close in on you. Most students considered college life to be a broadening experience, but Moffat discovered that what they thought constituted this broadening had very little to do with their formal education. Rather, it was the result of particular kinds of out-of-classroom learning, especially those that they made possible by themselves and for themselves. Undergraduates operate under a conception of the proper relationship between work and play. That is, students tend to articulate their lives in terms of trade-offs that they make between study time and leisure time. Whereas faculty tend to assume that the purpose of the university is learning, students generally aim to achieve a balance between late adolescent play and academic work within the loose constraints imposed by the university. In general, social life and academics are given about equal weight in student culture. Within academics, time and energy are primarily oriented toward vocational interests like the major rather than liberal ed courses like, oh, say, this one. Employment hours are seen as a constraint rather than a choice variable. Most students work if they have to in order to maintain the standard of living uh, that they had when they lived with their families. There is then a demand for easy courses, undemanding teachers, and easy A's, but it's not principally to avoid hard work. Rather, it's to offset the rigor of more challenging courses while keeping the overall course load manageable. Students learn to take massive shortcuts with their studies, especially in what they define as the non-essential courses. Most universities, for example, advise students to study two to three hours outside of class for every hour that they are in class. If you take a 15-credit load, this means that you would be spending another 30 to 45 hours per week on academic work. So, let's have a show of hands. How many of you actually work 35 to 40 hours on academic work outside of class every week? That's what I thought. Of course, many students have jobs to help pay for their education, and they have active social lives. Rebecca Nathan observes that the 2003 National Survey of Student Engagement reported that only 13% of college students study 25 or more hours per week, while 41% study 10 or fewer hours per week. At the same time, this amount of work effort results in generally good grades, Bs are better. The balance of fun and work shifts over time as students become increasingly concerned about the looming end of their transitional liminal lifestyle. Many students who emphasize fun and self-exploration over academic work in their freshman and sophomore years suddenly begin to think about 
the labor market that's awaiting them during their junior and senior years. So while the university seeks to push more scholarly work time, students are trying to find a balance. What are some of the techniques that students use to manage this balance between academics and social life experiences, and how does this affect student culture? Nathan says that class attendance is one place where students make judgments about how to use their time. She finds that class attendance depends on six different factors. Whether or not attendance is graded, students are more likely to show up if they think that it's going to affect their grade. Whether or not the class is large and the professor might notice if they're missing. Whether exams in the course are based on lectures, in which case you'd better attend, or on readings, in which case students um, may sometimes choose not to attend. Whether grades in the course are based on exams or are based on written assignments. Whether the class is perceived as boring. And whether or not the class meets at a convenient time, if it meets too early in the day by student standards. Or if it meets on a Friday, students may be less likely to show up for class. Another example of student uh, strategizing could be seen in reading practices. While professors assume that students should be expected to do all the reading in order to enhance their learning, students strategize what they will and will not read. Students are more likely to do the reading before class if they're going to be directly tested on it in class, if the reading is necessary to complete a homework assignment, or if they're likely to be called on individually to respond to some part of the reading. So overall, what we find both with class attendance and with um, students doing the course readings is that they're responding both to uh, peer socialization efforts and they're responding to risk-reward ratios about whether or not uh, they need to attend that to get a good grade rather than whether or not attending would be uh, better for their overall education. Writing is another domain where student culture sometimes conflicts with academic and administrative cultures. The undergraduate student culture includes writing practices that differ in function and meaning from the writing practices of faculty and administration. For example, more than 50% of college students have engaged in practices that the university considers to be academically dishonest. Yet most students don't feel that they have done anything dishonest. How can we explain this? Contemporary students violate a strong cultural norm of the institution because that norm violates their own values and experiences. Part of the confusion stems from the fact that contemporary university students are the wordiest and most writerly generation in history, literally swimming in a world of texts, not just books and papers, but also text messages, emails, blogs, tweets, and many, many other genres. Students come to the university already understanding the concept of intertextuality, the dependence of words and ideas on prior words and ideas, even if they've never heard the term. Your professors, as professional scholars, handle intertextuality through citation. This involves carefully delineating the boundaries of each piece of text, tracing its origin and documenting its source. Most students, however, have learned how to manage intertextuality through some form of what uh, literary scholars call patch writing. Patch writing is a practice that relies on copying from one or more source texts and then deleting some words, altering grammatical structures, or transposing syllables, and in so doing, making it yours. The systems of meanings and practices that constitute college life, as I've described it, affect students' writing practices. So Susan Bloom writes, the slowness and deliberateness of citation is at odds with students' customary focus on speed and efficiency, on completing one task as fast as possible so they can get on with the next one that is inevitably hanging over their head, whether it's another paper, a meeting for a group project, or a dorm party. Patch writing involves students in a speech community that is different from the speech communities of their professors. A speech community is any group that shares common practices of communicating, and we'll talk more about it uh, in about four weeks. The speech community of students has three key features. First, 
Rather than seeing their writing practices as immoral and unethical, most students see their practices as reasonable responses to the extraordinary pressures of college life. They tend to see the university's academic dishonesty policies as unreasonable and unrealistic. Second, undergraduate students live largely in a community of sharing, of cooperation rather than competition, which often extends to the sharing of ideas and the sharing of other written materials. Third, there's a powerful reluctance by students to inform on friends who, by the university standards, are cheating. Now, if students are in a period of liminality and anti-structure is in place, then um, you might predict what Moffat and Nathan both found, which is that the primary unit of socialization was not based on common structured activities like majors or uh, living learning communities or um, other kinds of uh, ways of structuring students to get together. Rather, students formed their own small communities of two to six friends early in their college experience. In fact, for many, these friendships were formed prior to coming to the university or in pre-college summer programs. The groups were based on similar demographics, people of like race, like ethnicity, similar religion, even the same hometown. Very few friendships are actually made in the classrooms. Nathan calls these ego-centered networks. They're intensely interactive networks that can become cliques. Networks can change over time, becoming either more intensely cliquish, as, for example, by a network of friends leaving the dorms to become co-residents in an apartment or group house, or by shifts in network membership. This social organization partially reflects expectations of communitas in that social relations, ranging from close friendships to parties to sexual relationships, are intensely organized and given very high priorities by most students. Students in Moffat and Nathan's studies are less interested in the highly organized activities that early generations of students uh, followed. Instead, most students are only vaguely aware of student government and relatively unstructured activities like hanging out, going out, and hooking up are what's valued. Spontaneity is valued. Discipline, even self-discipline, is devalued. And if someone is seen as being too disciplined, as um, staying home on a Friday night because they didn't complete their paper, for example, uh, they can even be openly mocked. One of the things that this shows is that as eager as undergraduates are to claim their independence, it is primarily an independence from bureaucratic and family structure and family authority. It's not independence from one another. Uh, undergraduates are highly susceptible to peer socialization. Students engage in a large number of microsocial actions designed to keep one another from standing out, creating drama, or getting into disputes. As students learn these norms, they integrate them into their life habits, and they police themselves so that they'll receive the social approval of their peers. Conflict avoidance is the undergraduate norm in college nowadays. Conflict resolution is not valued. Rather, people who create conflict, for whatever reasons, often suffer mild social sanctions or even ostracism. Even student activism operates this way. Activists put out signs and displays on the green, passively inviting students to think about their message, rather than confronting, marching, holding demonstrations, or other more overt forms of political action uh, that were done by previous generations of college students. An example of how student sanctions operate can be found in the normative practice of how students ask questions. Whereas professors want students to ask questions that address course topics and theoretical concepts, most students do not ask these kinds of questions. Both Nathan and Moffat found that the refusal of most students to actively engage in class discussion the way that teachers would prefer is linked to the quest for social normativity. Students who share information or ask questions about course content are often subject to small sanctions, such as rolled eyes or impatient gestures from their peers. Such questions make the students stand out and therefore not fit in. Legitimate questions, from a student viewpoint, are those that everybody is interested in. That is, those that involve class requirements, such as, is this going to be on the test? Or, how long should the essays be? Students are often even surprised to discover that professors 
whose worldviews lead them to be focused on the content of their classes, do not value these questions and may not even consider them when they're evaluating student class participation. Meanwhile, students exert social pressure against what they think of as illegitimate questions that can be seen as wasting the class's time or showing off. These include offering personal examples, contradicting or disagreeing with the professor, or asking for additional examples or illustrations of their point. Sexual and gender relationships are also important aspects of contemporary college culture. Students are part of a new sexual orthodoxy in which sexuality almost must be central to one's self, sense of self, and in which sexual experimentation and sexual satisfaction are important to both males and females. At the same time, student sexual behavior remains subject to a set of group-imposed norms and restraints. In dorms, gossipy peer group controls tend to regulate sexual behavior by emphasizing a desire for neighborly harmony. It's not what you do, it's how you do it and whether you bother your neighbors. In contrast to the male-female relationships in previous generations, Moffat finds that there are many close cross-gender relationships that do not involve sex. More recently, significant new forms of sexual behavior have emerged, such as hooking up and friends with benefits, in which sexual activity takes place outside the traditional role of relationship building. These avoid the high school concerns with uh, who's going out with whom that students associate with pre-college life, but they also avoid the commitment, engagement, marriage concerns that most students still associate with post-college life. So once again, we see this is life in a transition zone. Although many sociologists and social psychologists express worries that hooking up is replacing dating and, the, and other supposedly healthier forms of relationship, the ethnographic evidence in anthropology is that these coexist alongside rather than replace traditional sexual behaviors and mores like dating. What's more, as students prepare to leave college, they become increasingly concerned with more traditional committed forms of sexual relationships. In sum, where faculty may understand college as a period of intense learning and discovery, and administrators may understand college as uh, serving of clients and building long-term alumni engagement, students tend to see the university as a special life stage in which they're learning to manage the transition from teenager to adult in a safe environment that involves learning skills, but also self-growth through trying out new experiences, testing limits, and learning how to balance work and leisure within an intensely socially structured uh, environment. Okay, if you find this anthropological exploration of college culture interesting, stick with the class. There's a lot more to come.